The Grapes of Wraith by Zarkov Kowalski Part 1 Gerard was an easygoing man, so he ignored the offensive connotations to the remark. He leaned back in his host's finely crafted chair, putting undue strain on the joints and threatening to scuff the floor. He may be easygoing, but Gerard knows how to push his host's buttons. There is no need to be ashamed if you have no wine fine enough to match the bottle of 68 I brought from the Duke's personal estate. Gerard put extra emphasis on the word personal to apply a great value of having the Duke's favor, as if he were important at the royal court. He wasn't, but he also knew that the minor provincial nobility surrounding this table were both ignorant of courtly affairs and too prideful to admit it. Alexander, his host, momentarily scowled before quickly regaining his composure. While I would not hope to imply a vicomte such as myself could match the private reserve of a duke, I do have wines more than equal to those he would send out as gifts to those lesser to himself. I merely did not wish to cause any embarrassment. For, you see, my finest wine has a rumored curse about it, and I would not want a guest in my home to accrue shame, should they lack the courage to partake. Gerard's face was unmoved, but his easygoing nature was switching to cold and calculating logic. His fame and status came from his reputation as a dashing explorer, engaged in feats of high adventure. While he held no personal truck with concepts like honor, his financial well-being and access to creature comforts required he maintain that facade. But his reputation is not based on false deeds. He had indeed been to both exotic foreign lands and the dark forgotten corners of this one. He knew firsthand not all curses were superstitions. All of this took but the barest flash of time to work out his mind. He had fallen into a trap by his own errors, but he would prefer to risk a possible curse than a definite loss of lifestyle. The sight of the young baronet at the end of the table caused a flickering of spite to burn into his thoughts. Alexander, I could not abandon you to face a curse alone. Why, if my host insists on taking such a foolhardy risk upon himself, do the rules of hospitality not require I join him? asked Gerard, deliberately misinterpreting Alexander to imply the host wished to taste the cursed wine himself. But at least tell me of this curse that we shall face together. Alexander blanched. He too saw the young and ambitious Pierre at the end of the table. Pierre was newly arrived with an inherited title to a tiny destitute estate, and the obvious gleam of avarice in his eyes for Alexander's wealth. Vicomte is not a hereditary title, and Comte Papineau was a fickle romantic who abhorred cowardice, despite the country's dire need of those with managerial acumen. Alexander knew this would endanger his own position, should the upstart baronet spread news of his conversation. I may as well spread the misery to that social vulture, thought Alexander with a fatalistic resignation. And what of you, Pierre? Will you join us on this test of courage, or will you retreat while I describe the foul tale to our county's fine visitor? Boorish and blunt, lacking subtlety, thought Gerard of Alexander's clumsy maneuvers. You do me a great honor, Vicomte, declared Pierre. Alas, in my current station I have but poor table wines to contribute. For me to partake in this event without a suitable offering of my own would be shameful. Gerard shifted uncomfortably at Pierre's response. It is not that the baronet was either particularly artful or clumsy in his response, more that he felt the need to avoid drinking a fine wine at all. Pierre seemed to be young and ambitious. Young people were prone to disregard supernatural warnings, and ambitious sorts would not lightly risk status for fear of them unless there was some stronger evidence than tales to scare disobedient children. Had Gerard erred? No. It was these provincial yokels who were wrong. The curse, prodded Gerard. Alexander cleared his throat and spoke. It started over a half-century ago, on a dusty, impoverished estate of a local baronet. In fact, it was the same estate Pierre has since inherited. Then it was owned by the baronet Gilles Dampierre, an old man without heir. One day he returned from a sojourn to the east with a young and beautiful bride named Rebecca. Most suspected she was probably misled by Gilles, with tales of a wealthy estate, and that she was probably anticipating becoming a widow of high wealth and short order given his advanced years. The local folk thought it was hilarious, that Gilles was a sly dog and her a fortune seeker who got what she deserved. But she seemed not unhappy with her surroundings, even though she herself had to plant when Gilles had to let his servants go over the winter. He was quite destitute. Gilles was in great spirits, and she seemed the ever-affectionate bride. When Gilles died five years later, their estate was in quite a different financial situation. She had a green thumb beyond compare, 
that dusty hillside had become overgrown with grapevines. Its harvest was bountiful, and money began to fill the widow's coffers. The estate produced not only large quantities of wine, but of a flavor far surpassing any other local wines. Gerard interrupted, so she was accused of witchcraft. Naturally, said Alexander. And then they burned her alive, concluded Gerard. Alexander chuckled. Of course not. We use drownings here. She burned herself alive as part of setting her estate ablaze, that none of our envious hands should ever enjoy the fruits of her labor. Such was the curse she screamed from her balcony before the roof collapsed in flame. But when the estate lands and remaining belongings were auctioned off later, it turned out several dozen bottles of her final vintage survived. They have since gathered a rather ominous reputation. It is said she will return from the grave to kill any who partake of her wine. So far there have been rumors of six open bottles and six unexplained deaths. Do you dare risk a seventh bottle? Girard did quick metal math. Several dozen bottles, only six deaths. The deaths were all from people who took a bottle for themselves alone, and thus could have been drunk. It is possible only those six bottles have been opened. But Girard was willing to take the risk given what was at stake for him. Fear not, Alexander. I shall not desert you in your quest to prove your courage. Alexander stood up and fumbled in his breast pocket for a key. He walked towards the bookshelf and unlocked a small cupboard at its base. He could be heard moving several small items before relocking the cupboard. When he stood up and turned around, he was holding a dark green bottle with a singed label and a great mass of malformed wax dripping down the neck as far as the heel in some spots. It seems to have been near the fire. That may have damaged the seal, said Gerard. It could have turned to poison. Alexander, oh? I must admit I know little about the storage of wine. For the rest of my stock, that is the domain of my servants. If the seal is broken, then the wine has been exposed to the air for some decades. Ignoring the loss of flavor, it can be quite deadly. This may well be the source of the rumored curse. Any already intoxicated individual, imbibing an unsafe bottle alone, would likely be found dead by morning. That bottle may be better used as a conversation piece. There is no bravery in knowingly drinking poison, after all, concluded Gerard. There does seem to be enough extra wax that the seal is still intact, interrupted Pierre. While your explanation seems likely for the cause of the curse, you are in luck with this particular bottle. You both have the opportunity to both enjoy such a vintage and prove your courage against the curse. I fear no curse, said Alexander, with renewed conviction, his spirits obviously buoyed by the recent insights. Gerard, however, glared silently at Pierre's destruction of his social escape route, which would have allowed him to save face. Had it been intentional? When Alexander inserted the screw, no blood spewed from the cork. When the bottle was opened, it emitted no unearthly moan. Only wine poured forth into a glass, and no distant wails were heard as it was let to breathe. The three men sat in silence for half an hour. Pierre picked at the crusts of bread still on his plate, using them to swab up bits of duck fat. Alexander had poured water for himself and Girard to rinse their mouths with, and Girard simply stared out the window into the darkness, the crackling fire in the hearth the only background noise. Finally, Alexander spoke. I suppose it has had enough time to breathe. Shall we, Girard? Girard nodded, and the two took mouths full of water and swished about before spitting into their mugs. I do hope it lives up to the positive half of its reputation, mused Girard. Alexander silently poured two glasses of white wine. Girard was visibly taken aback. You expected red, no doubt, with its associations with blood and vampires and other ghoulish terrors, asked Alexander, a satisfied smirk upon his face. I suppose I did, said Girard, an unusually honest response. The two raised their glasses in a silent toast before each taking a sip. Alexander smiled. Delightful, he exclaimed. It is a perfectly sweet dessert wine, which then paused as he noted Girard's face. Girard was frowning. "'What has you behaving as such in the face of such a generous treat?' asked Alexander, with a growing hint of annoyance. "'Surely you do not pretend I exaggerate the traits of my gift to Pierre?' "'The wine is exquisite. By far the best I have ever had, the privilege of tasting,' said Girard, dryly. "'Then you merely feel distraught about how much more generous a wine offering I have provided? Instead, be joyous at the generous, uh, generosity you have received, 
said Alexander, with a rising level of smugness in his voice. Girard nodded silently, but that was not his concern. The wine had been cooked in fire, and stored in the cupboard for decades. Wine did not last forever, especially not in such conditions. There was no earthly way it could maintain such a brilliant flavor. Girard felt doom approaching deep in his bones. Part 2 the remainder of the evening involved some small talk about local issues and a few mildly amusing anecdotes. The steam seemed to have been let out of the conversation, as the bottle was shared between Girard and Alexander. Girard was quite happy to wrap the evening up, his sense of unease growing. He tapped into some of his less reputable tricks to slide some silverware up his sleeve and pocketed a container of salt. Every noise and gust of wind outside tensed his muscles. As the fire burned low, Girard picked up a candlestick and retired to his guest suite. It was a well-furnished and cozy little room with a single east-facing animal-horned window. It had a small, single bed covered in thick wool blankets, a petite vanity with a built-in wash basin, and a cross hung above the door. "'I suppose I had better get started,' says Girard, as he took stock of his options. He looked under the bed and smiled as he pulled out a brass chamber pot. Tucking it under his arm, he checked the drawers of the vanity and removed a neti pot, a candle, and a mostly empty ink pot. Girard scanned the room again, looking for anything else he may have missed. This will have to do, he said as he emptied his pockets onto the floor. A container of pilfered salt, a silver place setting, five silver coins, a gold cross necklace, and a single vial of holy water that he has ensured is always on his person since the vampire incident of seven years prior. Girard started by carefully pouring a line of salt along the bottom of the door, and then moved over to repeat the process by the window. It was there he noticed his breath was visible, and the faint hint of moving, moonlit shadows against his window. Girard steadied his breathing, and carefully lined salt under the window in what he assumed was the nick of time, for small dots of frost appeared on the window alongside what Girard swears looked like the shadows of small human hands. The window's latch began to slide up on its own, so Girard began hammering the silverware between the window and the ledge with the bedpan, preventing the window from swinging inward. The window rattled slightly, and then the bent and mangled cutlery seemed to flash with a small spark. There was an audible hiss, and the warmth returned to the air. As he hurried over to the door, he heard Alexander rising from his own room and shouting about the commotion. Alexander was only a few paces outside Girard's door, muttering obscenities, when he let out a blood-curdling scream. Girard took the wooden cross from above the door and wedged it into the latch. Alexander reached Girard's door and tried in vain to pull it open. Help! It is her phantom! Help me! he pleaded. Girard held the door shut, despite all rules of honor and hospitality. Alexander screamed loudly once more before there was a thud as a body hit the floor. Girard moved away from the door as once more a chill descended over him. The door rattled briefly and the cross began to smolder. The chill quickly departed. Girard once more scanned his room, for he knew this was not over. Girard withdrew a drawer from the vanity and smashed it upon the ground. He quickly scooped the pieces into the chamber pot, along with a dry hand towel from the wash basin. He crumbled the extra candle into the chamber pot and carefully lit the detritus with the failing light of his candlestick. He heard the slow squeak of iron nails being pulled from wooden planks on the floor above his room as small plumes of plaster dust began dropping from the ceiling. Girard placed the neti pot into the fire and lay upon the ground, watching the smoke pool upon the ceiling and listening to the noise. Girard watched for nearly half an hour. The chamber pot fire was but glowing coals when Girard heard the planks snap and saw the smoke funnel into the growing hole above him. Girard then carefully poured the single vial of holy water he carried into the neti pot, causing it to hiss and let out puffs of steam as it began to boil. There was an inhuman scream on the floor above, and the sound of breaking planks ceased. For a brief moment there was silence, but it was soon followed by a great wailing and the sound of breaking furniture. "'It appears our phantom has the temper of a poltergeist,' said Girard, in a muttering tone. "'But I don't suppose there is enough holy water to boil until morning.' He was talking to no one in particular, but he found it calmed his nerves to do so. The next speaking Girard did was not to calm his nerves. To the contrary, the low monotone noises he uttered caused him to feel both a growing anxiety and terrible pain behind his eyes. The water boiled for nearly forty-five minutes, 
and the spirit took five more to notice the absence. But the work resumed, with much faster pace. Gerard saw the skeletal hands rend and tear a larger and larger hole in the ceiling. Gerard held out his small golden cross in his ink-stained hand as he lay in bed, half under the covers. Down from the ceiling floated a partial human skeleton, surrounded by the spectral image of an angry young woman. The phantom slowly floated towards Gerard, with a look of annoyance on its face, always keeping its gaze from looking directly at Gerard's small cross. With a sudden burst of speed, Gerard threw a handful of silver coins from his left hand directly at the ghost. It instinctively flinched away, and then turned back with a snarl as Gerard flung back the covers from the bed. The mirror from the vanity had been removed and painted with occult runes from the monument of Nagal Kish. As soon as the spirit gazed upon its reflection, it disappeared, and only its reflection remained. Gerard quickly covered the mirror once more, and broke it with a blow from his elbow. Under the covers he heard the screaming of the phantasm as it found itself unable to escape its prison of mirror shards. Gerard noticed he was bleeding from his elbow, a superficial cut, but it was ruining his shirt. He used his pillow to apply pressure to the cut, and waited for morning's light to banish the spirit back to the realm of the dead. With the crow of the rooster, he knew he had survived another day, but that the spirit would return at dusk. Part 3 As the servants left the rooms at dawn, there was the predictable wailing, and a rider was sent to the local church. Gerard was worried he may get bogged down with the need for explanations, but the spectre had been neither quiet nor subtle at night, largely due to Gerard's meddling. The servants wanted him to disappear post-haste and take his curse with him. Gerard was packing his horse when Pierre approached him. "'It would seem the curse is real. Do you think to outrun it?' asked Pierre. "'No. I plan to speak with the priest and perhaps gain what aid the church may give.' and then destroy the creature by sending it back from whence it came, once and for all, said Gerard. And you hope that you may stay at the church at night, to keep safe on its hallowed ground, asked Pierre. Gerard raised his eyebrow. There was a catch Pierre was dangling about. I observed the broken mirror in your bed. Quite unusual. A zealous priest might suspect black magic, perhaps some sort of ritual to summon a demon, mused Pierre. Where was Alexander's body found again? Is this extortion or a warning? Forgive my bluntness, but I fear I have little time to waste guessing today. Pierre waved aside the rudeness. A warning. If you speak to the priest, you may find yourself spending far more time than you'd like on hallowed ground, most likely in unpleasant circumstances that last until your last breath. To flee would make me a fugitive, said Gerard, but I also suspect there is more to your coming here. I must once more play the part of a Reichfolk bumpkin and ask you to get to the point. The public nature of this event has made the rumored curse into a proven calamity, and there will be great tales told in even the royal court about those involved. I myself have only a bit part, it seems, said Pierre. Because you did not partake in the wine, said Gerard. Or did I? asked Pierre. Only yourself, Alexander, and the ghost could say I did not. Your plan, or should I say scheme, pressed Gerard. All three of us drank the wine. As the two survivors, we will vow in front of the servants to track down and destroy the spectre who slew their master. You will either succeed, and we will both be heroes, or you will die, and I will claim to have banished the spectre with, I don't know, a piece of a relic, or the true love of a maiden, or some other such night soil. If you do destroy the spectre, I will be famous enough to shield you from scrutiny, provided you do not linger in the area, since there is no suspicion of witchcraft upon my actions. I wouldn't want you to confess anything, after all. Written records saying it was black magic, coerced lies or not, would ruin my legend and standing. I would become recast as a simpleton, duped by the evil Gerard. Do you accept this arrangement? asked Pierre. Gerard hopped on his horse and rode out into the courtyard, where the servants were milling. The curse appears quite real, and it seems the baronet and myself are obliged to avenge your master. While the morning is still young, you must take all that we and your master touched last night, and burn it in the pit, lest any foul magic spread. The baronet and I shall ride forth on a quest to put the spirit to rest, and remove the shadow that now hangs over this estate. He then sent his horse into a gallop, and rode towards the crossroads. Pierre spat out a quick mare and chased after him, 
since they hadn't actually discussed a location to regroup. Part 4 The pair sipped their drinks on the patio of the town's boulangerie. One of us should look through the local records office for any information on Gilles, Rebecca, or the estate, said Gerard, while the other procures supplies we will need. I shall gather the supplies, said Pierre quickly. Do you not think perhaps you should review the records, as you are a local noble who owns the estate in question, said Gerard. But I know the local area's ill repute, as we will need to hire some labor, replied Pierre. Why would we need labor? asked Gerard suspiciously. Pierre looked legitimately stunned for a moment. We are gentlemen. We do not toil in the dirt with shovels like peasants. What would people say? Sensible for your goals, but you do not know what charms we may need to fight the supernatural, either. Why are you so quick to be in charge of supplies? pressed Gerard. Pierre looked indignant, then paused for a split second. He had an oddly blank face before switching to something resembling shame, and leaned in to whisper, I must confide this secret. I am barely literate. So that was it, thought Gerard. His air of culture is not but a fraud. Gerard nodded, and thought silently for a moment before speaking. Remember this list exactly. We need two lanterns, oil, several pouches of pure sea salt, an oak stake, digging implements, rope, several white wax candles, any rosaries available, and a cat in a cage. Do you have all of that? Pierre nodded. A strange list, but I will gather it. We shall meet back here at noon, said Gerard, before he finished his tart and took a final sip of his drink. He dropped a single gold coin on the table and wandered towards the center of town. The records were both spotty and poorly organized. Many events had no more than a single line, while others had rambling diatribes about unrelated matters. He found no record of burial or death for Rebecca, but he couldn't be sure that didn't happen given the notes. She wouldn't be in the church graveyard, so if there was no record of her being buried in the civic records, he would have to assume her body was never recovered. Gerard resented that provincial scribes even bothered. Nevertheless, he did find something interesting. Gilles had hired diggers and masons to work on an expansion to his wine cellar, then brought forth a complaint that they had done no work. They proclaimed they had, but the judge deemed them liars and had them put in stocks after seizing all of their property and hobbling them. When Gerard returned at noon, he saw that Pierre had their horses ready to go. He also had with him a hunched-back figure in a tattered black cloak, who was holding the reins of a mule, pulling a wagon that had recently been hauling night soil, given the smell. "'Who is this?' asked Gerard. "'None of us have or shall give names until we part ways,' said Pierre. "'Refer to him as three, myself as one, and you shall be two. I am told I shall be digging into things best kept quiet. Secrets and shovels happen to be the two things I am most skilled with. I was promised a gold crown from each of you, tomorrow at sunrise, before we head our separate ways, said the hunchback. Did you acquire everything I asked for? Gerard asked Pierre. I did. I also procured some garlic and a cross, in case the oaken stake was for a vampire, said Pierre. It is not, said Gerard but checking the stake as oak is easier than checking the salt as pure sea salt, and I must be certain you did not take liberties with my supplies. Pierre had a strange look upon his face that Girard couldn't quite place. It was curious to Girard that Pierre seemed aware of the intricacies of vampires. He resolved to keep an eye on Pierre. Part 5 How poetically typical, thought Girard as they approached the estate. He held his hand out to the horizon to gauge the remaining time before speaking. The sun sets in a little under two hours. Pierre was busy hitching his horse to an olive tree, while the hunchback was almost comically overburdening himself with all of the supplies. He would make a hell of a racket when he walked. I'm going to scout around the fields, while you two excavate the rubble from the main floor. See if you find any remnants of her body, said Gerard. I will do no such thing, said Pierre indignantly, before continuing, but he shall and I shall supervise his efforts to ensure he is not afflicted by sloth. The hunchback cast an unflattering glare at Pierre, with his unsettling, bulging eyes. Girard leisurely strolled through the weed-choked fields that were still littered with decaying trellises. The soil was so dusty that even the weeds looked sickly. On a fleeting whim, he pulled free a trellis 
and used it to disturb the earth around the hole he had just made. Seeing something glint, he bent down and fished around the hole with his fingers. He pulled forth a clipping of an eighth of a silver piece, as well as a rotting scrap of leather, and what looked like a charred human baby tooth. There were probably other things lost to time in among that soil, but clearly Rebecca had worked magic upon the fields. This did not surprise Gerard, but it was still a confirmation of nothing else. Gerard looked at the sun again. There would be under an hour before nightfall by the time he made it back to the others. He sighed wistfully and wandered back. Gerard parted back some climbing vines from the entryway as he stepped over the threshold into the ruins. The building was a hollow shell full of rubble and weeds. A few rotting portions of once mighty oaken beams caused long shadows to stretch along the ground like the grasping fingers of a malicious spirit. This unnerved Gerard, not because he suspected it was actually the work of Rebecca, but because the mere fact that his mind drew the connection showed a weakness in his nerves. It meant he might make mistakes in the coming conflict, mistakes of the sort that would almost certainly spell his doom. Pierre had set his cape upon a small pile of rubble to sit upon, and was half watching the hunchback work. Gerard had to admit that the hunchback seemed a very able and efficient worker. Most of the rubble on the ground level had already been sifted through and sorted. Small rocks, bricks, remnants of wood, and the like. A portion of the floor had collapsed where the wine cellar ran beneath the home. Pierre called out, I have bad news, too. We have found no bones among the rubble. Wood fires do not burn hot enough to turn bones to ash, replied Gerard. If her bones are not present, nor were they recovered for burial, then perhaps she did not die in the manor's blaze? A secret passage? asked Pierre quizzically. Then she could have escaped to anywhere in the world. Why would she then haunt the wine of this particular vineyard? I suspect she did not make it away from the estate. Perhaps she was already injured, and died of her wounds during the flight, said Gerard. But in any event, we know her bones are not among this rubble, meaning she must have escaped the upper levels. I suspect she built a secret chamber in her wine cellar, so we should continue the search below ground. The hunchback glanced at Pierre before sighing and clambering over towards the collapsed floor. First he heaved down his tools, then secured a rope to the stone remnants of a chimney, and proceeded to rappel down. Pierre calmly watched this, and then stood up and brushed off his cape, before donning it and walking past Girard to the estate grounds. "'Where are you going?' asked Girard. "'The contents of the wine cellar were salvaged and auctioned. Therefore there must be a proper entrance that has already been cleared of debris, which I could simply walk through rather than scurrying about like vermin,' replied Pierre. That made a great deal of sense to Girard, and so he followed Pierre out into the setting sun. He was getting nervous. Would this be his final adventure? The hunchback had already cleared a good deal of rubble by the time Girard had found the storm cellar doors hidden behind an overgrown tangle of thorn bushes. The setting light of the sun illuminated the steps down in an orange-red glow. Girard held the caged cat in one hand and a lantern in the other as he descended. He noticed that the hunchback already had the other lantern with him, hung from a rusted sconce embedded in the brick wall. Girard sat the cage upon the ground and pulled a tangled mess of rosaries from his pocket, which he handed to Pierre. Take these and hang them from the sconces along the walls, and it wouldn't hurt to give the sconce a twist or a tug while you're at it. In case they open to this secret chamber of yours, asked Pierre. Yes, though I doubt the passage would be mechanically sealed. She was a witch, after all, said Girard. Girard began working as Pierre dutifully wandered through the cellar attaching rosaries. First he used his pocket-knife to cut a hole in the bottom of the first bag of salt, and began pouring a large circle of salt on the ground. When he ran out of salt in his first bag, he opened his second. Still having a fair amount left over, he then poured a small circle around the cat-cage, and poured a line in front of the steps out of the cellar. He still had some left over, so he stuck a handful of loose salt in his pocket, and tied the burlap sack with the remaining bit shut. He mused to himself that it would make a suitable blackjack, as he threw it onto the hunchback's pile of tools. Girard dusted his hands off on his thighs, and picked up his lantern, to begin an effort whose scope and tasks he was unsure of. Girard was betting there was a secret extension of the wine cellar, and that it had to be hidden with magic. He began poring over the walls, looking for anything unusual. He looked for witch marks, sniffed for sulphur, felt for unnatural cold, and even periodically closed his eyes in case he could somehow sense a presence. Sweat beaded on Girard's brow, as he realized he had no idea how to find this secret chamber. Merde, he cursed. 
What? said the hunchback, loudly, as he paused from sorting through a mound of rubble. I cannot find any sign of witchcraft on these walls, Gerard spat bitterly. You mean like witch marks and things? asked the hunchback. I doubt anything so obvious at this point, said Gerard. It must be more arcane and esoteric than I have any knowledge of. Oh, all right, said the hunchback. I thought you might be looking for them weird Northman squiggles I found on the floor. At this moment, both Gerard and Pierre slowly turned to face the hunchback without saying a word. Do you mean runes? asked Gerard in an unusually polite and cheerful tone. Yeah, in the ruins. It's here in the cellar. Weird squiggly letters that smelled a bit like rotten eggs when I touched them, said the hunchback. It was on the wall next to that big floor beam. The beam was too big to move, so I just started piling the other rubble there after I was done checking for bones. Gerard spoke slowly and coldly. I need you to move that rubble and that beam right now. It will take me a good half hour to clear it away, replied the hunchback. At that point, the cat began to hiss and scream from within its cage. Part 6 A definite chill began to fill the air, as the cat's cage began to rock back and forth with its inhabitants' frenzy. "'Can you smash a hole in that wall right now?' demanded Gerard frantically. "'I sup began the hunchback, before Gerard interrupted. "'Just break the damn bricks however you can.' Gerard raced back to the circle of salt and fumbled in his pouch for candles, spilling several of them across the floor. Pierre was already inside the salt circle, rolling a pair of silver coins between his knuckles. Even in his current heightened adrenal state, that struck Girard as something to follow up on. Girard crouched in the center of the salt circle as the hunchback began striking the brickwork with the sharp and rhythmic blows of a pickaxe. The adrenaline was making Girard's hand shake as he gathered five of the white candles, then lit them in his lantern, and placed them equidistantly spaced on the inner edge of the salt circle. When he finished, he let out a deep sigh his eyes widening as he noticed the visibility of his breath. He slowly turned around to see the dreaded specter of Rebecca silently glowering at him from the edge of the circle. Having been thwarted previously, it seemed more in control of its actions. The spirit was not flailing blindly, but instead seemed to have replaced its blind fury with an aura of loathing and a calculated cruelty. Then he noticed the noise, a faint and constant whispering. Girard looked over at Pierre to see him with heavy eyes, staring off into the distance. His hands had stopped toying with the silver coins. His feet began shuffling sluggishly towards the salt circle. All the while the sound of the hunchback's repeated blows to the brickwork continued. Girard reached into his pocket and threw a handful of salt at the specter's face while screaming, Back! The spirit recoiled from the contact and staggered back, giving Pierre a moment to recover and quickly avert his gaze. The ghost also had a moment to pay more attention to its surroundings, and it realized then that there was someone nearby who was behind no such circle. Girard spit at the spirit as it strode towards the hunchback, but it paid Girard no heed. Its ethereal footfalls were silent upon the floor, and left a trail of frost behind it. It was then that the sound of collapsing bricks caused the hunchback to turn about and begin to shout, I see a body in... before freezing at the sight of the specter. He tried to dart towards the rope, but the specter closed the distance with alarming speed and reached the rope first. He stumbled back on his heels as the spirit reached its hands toward his throat. Pierre took this moment to snap his fingers and flick a silver coin with impressive accuracy into the center of the apparition. The spirit paused for a moment to shoot a wrathful glare towards Pierre before returning its attention to the hunchback. In that moment, the hunchback had shown expert agility and managed to spring back to his feet while drawing the cross from the loose supplies strewn at the bottom of the rope. The specter lurched back at the sight of the cross, suddenly brandished mere inches from its face. The cross smoldered and embers floated into the air. "'Smash the lantern on the body!' screamed Girard. "'We must burn the body!' The hunchback quickly threw his lantern through the broken hole in the wall, but there was no flash of light from burning oil. The lantern had not broken. The desiccated body had cushioned its landing. The hunchback was already fleeing towards the steps out of the cellar, making a running leap over the line of salt with the spirit quick on his heels. Girard sensed that this was his moment. The salt would not hold for the night. He darted towards the flickering light of the still intact lantern. He stumbled onto the rubble pile, tearing a great gash in his right calf. He clutched a brick in his right hand as he crawled over the pile, not daring to look back at the spirit that was surely closing on him. He quickly peered through the broken masonry to stare at a desiccated corpse laying fetal on the floor, an oil lantern 
leaning against its stomach. With his own panting breath now clouding his vision in a supernatural cold, he shoved his arm through the hole and spiked the brick under the lantern. There was an immediate conflagration as oil and flame spattered over the dry corpse, though he was not able to watch it burn. Girard was wrenched into the air by the spirit's unearthly strength. The skin around his neck burned under its frozen grasp. Girard stared into its hateful eyes, feeling the life drained from his body in seconds that felt like eons, but great clouds of embers and ash began to consume the spirit's snarling face, and as soon as it had begun, Girard was dropped onto the jagged rubble. He tried to break his fall, but mostly only managed to dislocate one of his fingers as he let out a vulgar scream of Tabernac! Pierre plucked the candle and sauntered over to Girard, helping him to his feet. The threat may not be over. We must investigate the chamber. Girard shakily crawled into the chamber, followed carefully by Pierre. It was a long, nicely furnished room, well lit by the burning body. The walls were covered with frescoes of star charts and a low shelf full of labeled jars and bottles. This must have been her sanctum, muttered Girard, who then noticed Pierre examining the hole the hunchback had smashed in the wall. What do you see? Scratches on the inside of the wall, said Pierre. I suspect she planned to wait out the mob and escape, but the rubble from the manor prevented the door from opening. An amateur mistake, to not have the door open into your sanctum. You seem to know much more than I would expect of an illiterate provincial noble, said Girard warily, having drawn his rapier. Without standing or turning around, Pierre spoke slowly. You have no doubt guessed I am none of those things. I began to suspect as such in town, said Girard. Might I ask what my first mistake was? said Pierre. The garlic, said Girard. Oh, do not think me paranoid. That was but the first small concern which caused me to begin weighing your actions. Such is the nature of any craft. Practice makes perfect, said Pierre. You assume more of a future than you may have, said Girard coldly. There is no need for such talk, said Pierre. I had heard that Rebecca's fortune was never found, that her jewels were hidden somewhere on her estate. To truly search for them would first require removing her spirit. So you engineered the whole situation, that I may face the spirit and perhaps defeat it, finished Girard. It is a compliment that I believe so strongly in your abilities, added Pierre. I doubt I was the first attempt you made, said Girard dryly. Shall we split the treasure? asked Pierre. The gems are plastered under the frescoes. I think you shall pluck the gems for me in case they are cursed, and I may decide to let you live despite the treachery. Move, said Girard, poking Pierre's back with the tip of his rapier. The two walked over the nearest fresco, and Pierre scraped away plaster from the image of Polaris, revealing a sparkling gemstone behind it. Girard smiled and began to speak. It seems there is a sweet taste to these then paused to smirk at his own joke, before continuing, Grapes of ra- He never finished the sentence, as his unconscious body struck the ground. The hunchback had managed to move in behind him to strike, his footfalls as silent as a cat. The hunchback stared eye to eye with Pierre, holding the salt-filled makeshift sap that Girard himself had made in one hand, a brick in the other. "'Oh, thank you for rescuing me, good sir,' said Pierre. "'He went mad with the ghost.' "'I am no fool,' said the hunchback, "'and I have heard all you said.' "'I don't suppose you would consider splitting the treasure,' said Pierre, eyeing Girard's rapier. "'I also want his boots,' said the hunchback. "'The dead need no such finery.' "'I don't think he's dead,' said Pierre slowly. The hunchback winked at Pierre, and then brought the brick down on Girard's head with a vicious overhand swing. Pierre considered acting aghast, but honestly— this did make things a lot simpler. Deal, said Pierre. And that is the story of how Jack the Grifter and Abraham the Grave Robber first met.